Okay. So, take notes. <laughs> as an update, uh, just where we left off. So far, uh, we are refactoring our movie model. We have removed the cast property from our movie model, which is right here, because we are going to be adding cast members to our movie, adding performers um, via a referencing instead of by putting them directly in via comma separated string. So we've removed the cast property from our movie. We went and refactored our new .ejs and removed the entry field where we are going to be entered, where we were entering those um, as comma separated text values. And then in our show.ejs, we are going to, uh, we stubbed up this spot where we're going to be adding cast list down the road later, later on in the afternoon or in the, in the lesson here. And then there's going to be another place right here where we can add uh, a form that will allow us to add a cast member to a movie. So that is all we have done so far. We also went into the create function right here, the create controller, and we removed the two lines of code that were taking that um, string in, removing the spaces between the commas and then splitting the array into um, different actors based on those comma-separated comma values. Uh, finally, here is the new full CSS for everything today. Not much has changed, but again, we're not gonna spend time going over crazy CSS stuff. So I want you to take all of this CSS, copy it and paste it over what you have already. So we're gonna do that. Public, style sheets, select it all, just paste right over it. It's really only like three things we're adding, but this just cleans up some of our code. So we don't have to focus on CSS today. So I'm going to push starter code for Friday. So if you wanna pull, if you had any questions or trouble following along with that, I know we just did a little bit of refactoring. You can go ahead and that won't mess up our custom error pages, right? If we fetch it. Uh, I have a custom error page. So if you have a custom error page, it will pull mine. Okay. But what you could do if you want that to be the case um, is you could call your error page error2.ejs. I, I had mine as a partial for error header and then I had a separate styling sheet that I linked it to then you should be fine. The thing that is going to change is that in your server.js where you're linking to your error page right here, that will change back to this if you pull my code. So you'll just have to change this one line to whatever it is that you're rendering and you'll be good. What's the command, the git command to get the code again? Git fetch space <laughs> dash dash all. It's in the readme too, yep. Yeah, it's in the readme. So you should, if, have you pulled my code before, Nick? No. Um, what happens when you type git fetch, fetch dash dash all? It says fetching upstream. Cool. When that's done, you're gonna do git reset dash dash hard upstream main. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what we talked about again with many to many models is having a separate data resource for um, a performer, a separate data resource for movie. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna link the two of them by adding an object, um, an object ID. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by creating our performer model. So let's go into our models and we're gonna create a file called performer.js. This performer is gonna be its own data entity. It's its own resource. So it's gonna have its own routes. It's gonna have its own controller. Everything is gonna be the same as we did for movies, just separate resource. So let's start by stubbing up our, um, our schema. And so it's gonna be a pretty simple one, right? All we need to do to keep track of the uh, performers is we're gonna get their name and their birthday. That's it. So const mongoose 
Let's require mongoose. We're going to say const schema, capital S, equals require or mongoose.schema. Why, what, what is the purpose of this line right here? What is this doing? Is it like allowing it to assign Hold Mongo schema to it so that it's like pull it or like so it's taking in all of the mongoose methods? It's allowing mongoose to pull from the MongoDB database, right? No, it's a mongoose shortcut. database. My bad. It's just a shortcut. That's all it is. We're going to be typing schema right here, and this is just a way to shorten that. So if we didn't want to type this, we could say right here mongoose.schema. That's literally all this is doing. So if you didn't want to type that out, you could say const performer equals new mongoose.schema. You'll see that a lot out in the, out in the wild. But because we're, we were using multiple schemas in our example yesterday, rather than having to type mongoose.schema twice, we just made a little shortcut variable. That's all that is. So let's stub up our performer schema. Const performer schema equals new schema. We're going to have a name property. Name is going to be a string. It's going to be required. And it is going to be, it has to be unique. That's a hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge with a bonus for your uh, flight slab. Unique. You might end up using that for your destinations. We also have a uh, property born. So that's when the uh, performer's birthday is. So all we have is name and birthday. We're going to add timestamps. Always add timestamps. There's no reason not to add timestamps. And then we're going to export it. So we're going to say module.exports equals mongoose.model. We're exporting it as performer. And the thing that we're actually exporting is our performer schema. Well, that was easy. Right? Does everyone understand what we just did? You should. It's nothing new. We've gone over this a couple times now, right? We started with this on Monday or Wednesday. We did it again yesterday with our destinations. Now we've done it with performers. Can that second argument only accept timestamps or is it like, are there other things you can put in there as well? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I would imagine there are probably other things you can put in there, but I don't know what they are. That'd be a good thing to look up. And when you do that, uh, share the answer with the rest of us. Sounds good. I have Jennifer? a question. Yep. Um, so for structuring schemas, in the movie.js file, we put the review, yeah, like the, re the review schema and the movie schema. Mm -hmm. And then we made a whole separate file for the performers. Mm -hmm. And I, the way I'm understanding it is the schemas hold uh, like the data structures uh, that the user is going to interact with mm -hmm. on the page. Um, how come we made a whole new one for performers? That is a fantastic question. It's not one to many and many to many. Yeah, Patrick looked like he was about to answer it. So this review schema, is it, it, it's embedded, right? We talked about that yesterday. This reviews, our reviews live within our movie. So if we take a look at our database, we have movies, and each of those movies have, let me find one that has reviews.
I seriously not have any reviews on any of these? You want to not have any because we just added it? Uh, well, I reviewed some we of them. We only added the one yesterday, I think. And then we deleted the review to see that we could gotcha. delete it. Okay. Well, let me refresh my database because I thought I had. Anyway, the reviews are going to live within the movie. So we're going to have, um, it's the, this data is structured the same exact way in the schema templates that it is in the database. That's, that's how it works. That's why we do it that way. But what we're eventually getting to today is instead of storing the performers inside of this movie too, the performers are going to be their own entity, their own thing. And because of that, they need to be in their own separate file. So take a look at that again. Our movie has all of the data for the movie, right? It has the release year, the title, the MPAA rating. And we have another schema embedded within it for reviews. So that, you know, we have the template for our reviews. It has to meet this data specification. But then each review that we add is added to a specific movie. With performers, we don't have to associate a performer with anything. We just create a performer and it will exist as a performer, just like we do with movies. And what we're going to be doing is after we've created a few performers, we're going to go in and we're going to establish that many to many relationship. And we're going to say, hey, this performer is in these different movies. And you're going to see how we, how we do that. Does that help answer why we separate them? Yeah, that's kind of where, like, it was linking up in my head and I just wanted to make sure I fully got it. Okay, thank you so much. So who can talk me through what you're gonna do in flights with the same approach? You have flights, what gets embedded within flights? Tickets. Tickets. Right, and what gets referenced? Destinations. Yeah, that's it. So you're gonna have a flights model. Now what's your other model? Ticket model. Tickets. Destinations. Destinations. Like destinations. You like don't need a separate. You don't need a separate model for tickets. You need a separate schema a that gets like put that. within your. Um, it gets embedded within the flight model, or within the flight schema. But you need a whole separate destinations uh, model because you're going to be creating destinations independent of the flights, right? If we take a look at that in the database, which should be here. Uh, don't take a look at that. I have it linked to a different database. That's the old way. The new way is yes, flights and destinations are your two models. Cool. So let's talk about what we need to do next. We have to follow that five step cycle. We need to start by identifying a route and implementing a UI to view a form for adding performers. Where's my chart? Uh, chart is right here. Okay. This is for performers. We need to do a get performers new to create a new resource. We know how to do that. We can go do that. So let's adjust our header EJS to put a new link in our nav bar. And this new link is going to be a place where we go to add performers to our database. So just copy this line right here, this add performers line. We're going to go into our header. And then right, right beneath our camera, we're going to add that link. When you refresh your page, you should see it pop up. Add performer, yay. What happens when you push that? 404, why did I get a 404 right there? If you don't have a route set up. There's no routes. Yeah, you don't have a route for it yet. Look what's next. So we're out in the controller. Let's go create those. Let's go into routes. Performers.js. 
Let's go into controllers. We know we're going to need a controller for it too. We're going to have functions for controllers. New file form .js. We'll start with the router code. Right? Go into our router. I stub up all of our routers the same way every time. Const express equals require express. Say const router equals require or express dot router. We're going to teach you a shortcut to make that even cleaner here than uh, when we get to game goose next week. And we need to require a performers controller because this we have to be able to import. Uh, wh what do we need access to? Why do we have to require our controller here? We're calling those functions in our routes. Right. We have to have access to all of those controller functions. That's why we're importing the module here. Or that's why we're requiring the module here. Dot dot controllers performers. Autocomplete. Down at the bottom, module dot exports equals router. Lowercase one. Ooh. Cool. Let's write that first route. Router dot get slash performers slash new. Where do we This is going to break because we don't, I don't go over that. So we are going to have to do one more step here. Who can tell me what step is not in these instructions that we need to do? Add it to the server. Right. We need to add it to server. So let's go do that. Let's go into our server.js. Up top, we're going to require a router. Oh my God, these bars are driving me nuts. Sorry. Okay. Now we're, now we're happy. So we're going to say const performers router equals require. We'll link that router. And then down below, we have to use it. App.use slash performers router. If you wanted to put performers here, you could totally do that. And then just not put the performers on this route. That would be an acceptable way of doing it. I'm gonna do what's in the lesson, but you could totally do that. That would make sense. Just like we did for tickets, if you're not tickets, but uh, reviews. If you wanted to have your reviews router start with reviews, you could do that too. So we've got that set up. Let's go back into our routes and write that route. We have router.get performers new. And that's going to be a what? It's going to be a new page, right? A page to render a form for entering a performer. So performers controller dot new. Our server gets unhappy because we don't have that function. So we're going to go into our controller function. Oh God, we got to stub this up too. What's the first thing we always do in our controller functions if we have a, a database? We import the model, right? Bring in the model so we have access to all those wonderful mongoose methods. So const performer equals require models slash performer. Then we have to have our exports, module.exports equals new. New is a reserved word, so we'll say new performer. Put that comma there because we know we're going to be adding other things here and we'll stub the function up function new performer rec res good 
Now, let's talk about this function. If you're looking at this function, you would think that all you'd need to do here is render a form, right? And that's what we should be doing. All we want to do is add a performer. Why are we looking up our performers before we do that? To make sure they don't already exist in the database. Yeah, we want to have a list of all the performers on the page to check them, right? That way our user can see whether or not they're already there. So this, this is going to, it's, you have to think about this stuff when you're setting these functions up. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll create that form to go and test it out, make sure it works. And then you'll go back and wrap it in these, um, you'll wrap it in that extra mongoose query. Realistically, all we needed to do here before we thought, well, you also want to think about your code ahead of time, right? You want to think about what data you're going to want on each page when you're going through your pseudo code for something like this. And if you had done that properly, you'd realize, hey, I need to pass all of the performers to this page. So I'm going to structure my controller function such that I have to look all those performers up before I even get started. Um, so that's another example, and I'm sure all of you saw this in unit one for your projects, why more detailed um, nitpicky pseudocode will help you write code more efficiently. It'll, it'll help you not have to go back as often and tweak things. So you really want to put some, a lot of extra time into you know, planning your apps out ahead of time before you get into the actually coding them out. So let's, let's code this out. Performer.find. What is the empty brackets? What are those doing? Getting all of the um, all of the performers. Correct. They're getting all of the performers. Returns them to a callback function. Error first callback function. And then what we're doing is we're rendering res dot render. We're going to render our performers new, which is a new.ejs within a performers directory, which we're going to go make here in just a moment. We're going to pass to that. We have to pass it a title because remember our header needs a title for every single page. That was, I think, what Erica posted in the support channel. You have to, the way that we set this up, because we put a title in our EJS tag on, uh, in our header, we have to pass it a title for everything or else it's going to break. So we'll call this title our add performer. We also need to pass it the performers that we just looked up, all the performers. Is anybody confused by what we just did? That performers at the end will be the same as performers colon performers? Yes. Okay. If I did this, Which one, which one of these performers, left or right, is the same as this? If I change this to banana, which one of these needs to be changed to banana? The left one. Right. Sounds like we have a disagreement. The right one because that's the value? Correct. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is what we're calling it on the page. This is the value that we're actually passing it in. So if for some odd reason I wanted to call my performers banana when I'm returning them, I'm saying find all the performers and return me a value with all of the performers that I found and call it banana. That's what get passed, gets passed to this callback function. And then when we render it to the page, we're going to say, hey, we're going to call it performers on the page. This would have to be banana for it to work. If you called this banana and this performers, it wouldn't work. Just always want to be clear about where these things are coming from. And, um, that's because we're calling it performers in both place or both places. It's it EJS or uh, ES6 allows us to just do that. It just says, oh, you know what? It's the same thing. Don't put 
performers call them performers. Just put performers. We'll take care of the rest for you. Makes it easy. We all good on that? Okay. Um, okay. Let's. We're trying to render something we don't have a view for, so let's go do that. Let's go into our views. As soon as I get done with this uh, post request, I'll go ahead and, and push my code. So let's go into our views. I'm going to create a directory called performers. Nothing new. Inside of that performers, we're going to create a new.ejs. Copy and paste this form. We'll talk about what's in it. Now we should see, if we go to our page, performers new now gives us a, a form. Oh, and hey, look at that. I see mine because I've already entered performers. You guys don't have those yet. But it's finding all the performers and it's putting them inside of option tags. You're going to need to do this on your lab. Select. Options suck. Oh, they're so cool though. They're better than checkboxes. All you have to do is take a select tag and wrap your options with it. That's how it works, right? So all you have to do is put a for each in here, iterate over it, and for every single performer we have, we're just gonna print out an option. Easy peasy. It's gonna look the same anytime you do it. So we're iterating over our performers and we're putting the name of the performer as an option. That's all we're doing. And then beneath that, we have another form here to add a performer. That looks pretty straightforward, right? It's a performer form. You give it the ID for styling. The action is a post method to slash performers. Is that the right method? Let's talk about that before I go back to the lesson plan. Does that look right? Yes. Who thinks that looks wrong? I was trying to trick somebody. No. Oh, thank God. oh, I got Brady. I think I got Brady. Well, I thought like, what that, I guess like, because for a second I thought because we dealt with new, because it's a new view, so it's like, I thought for a second you had to also include the slash new, but I guess you don't need that. Correct. We're going, it, chart, right? We're creating a new resource a post request to the plural form of that resource slash performers post request new post create that's all we're doing this isn't a nested resource that's what i want to get through to you guys that's why i attempted to trick you here right i want you to make sure you're thinking about this as its own new resource because that's what it is i know we've built up movies and reviews and all that other crap you got to put that out of your head for this this is a brand new resource just like movies is it's its own thing so it gets its own set of routes that are gonna be nice and simple for now. So we have that set up. It's got our born, it's a type of date, name, name field is born, name is name. So like we just talked about, let's go write that route. Let's go into our performers router, right beneath our other one, router.post slash performers. It's performers control dot create. Okay. Then we go over to our uh, controller function. Add it to the list. Create. Sub it up. Rec res. Now there's a little bit of stuff here um, that we need to talk about. This is again, some crazy scrubbing that we're doing. Um, but I want you to see this here. Essentially all we're doing, we have to fix the date for formatting to prevent day being off by one. Um, 
it's because the input field returns the date as year, 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 month, month, day, day. Um, there's a Stack Overflow article here if you want to go look that up and see exactly what's happening. I'm not going to delve in. I hate dates in JavaScript. So whoever said they select they hate select an option, like that's my one furious passion of hatred is for all things JavaScript date related. So, um, and I'm sure you'll feel the same way when you get into them. Dates suck in JavaScript. So um, you're just going to have to go with me on this one. All this is doing, these two lines of code is fixing that problem, making it so that our days are not off by one. So let's type that out. Actually, I'm, no, I'm not going to type that out. I'm just going to copy and paste that. We're going to type the rest of it though. So copy those two lines and get rid of the semicolons if you want. If you're like David and can't stand the side of a semicolon, then get rid of them. So, Or if you only use single spaces, if you don't use double spaces, like, like an old fart like me. So do you guys, who, who double spaces after a period? Oh, I definitely do. Yeah. You know, you're like not supposed to do that anymore. That's like a, an old thing. Since after when? periods and colons. I know, right? But uh, double space is in like, you it, press the space bar twice after you put a period? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's a single space. Now, I think Word itself now does that whenever you edit, uh, when you're doing formatting double space, it adds vertical, like a vertical margin to it and it double spaces for you. It makes the, the no, initial I'm, space at the end of a period longer. Really? Yeah. I, I, I it so. used to be taught that way it used yeah. to be after a colon and a period you put two spaces but apparently somewhere along the line they still they still as of like 2017 were teaching it in uh, professional development and organizational management yeah now ap officially updated their styles like a few years ago being like only single space yeah like it's like the standard now even though but it's a very old school way of thinking so it's I, yeah, can't it's it. I just type like that i can't even yeah. undo it i know when David and I oh, were writing wait. a lesson last night, it was like that. It was I would be typing things and double spacing it, and he'd go and fix all of my double spaces all the time. Like, <laughs> we horrible. used to do that in high school to make our papers longer. We would just add like double spaces. <laughs> the last. That's awesome. Put one in the middle of the sentence. Biases of our um, periods and like question marks and stuff. Like if you increase it by uh, like one point like, point five, it increases the space around it too. So good tricks. All right, sorry for that little off ramp. Why don't we take a break? Oh, wait, you know what? We're, we're not yet. We got what, like half a step left and we'll be good. So let's finish writing this performer function out and then we'll take a break. Um, so we added the magical date fixer thing. We want to create a new resource, right? Use our model performer.create. We're going to say rec.body because that's where our form data is coming from. Then we're going to pass it that error first callback function former stub that up and then we're just going to redirect back to that page because we want to continually add performers so res.redirect slash performers i can't type slash new So now, if all is well, we go to our performers page. I put a performer in, David Stinson, uh, five, five, uh, you know, David's young. When you were born, what, like 2004? Something like that, right? So now he's on the list. So that works. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Everyone happy with that? Cool. David's not 16 years old. So those are all of our, our actors. We have our form working. One of the things that I'm going to show you when we get into this next week is cleaner ways to write these code, this code um, using dot then. You don't have to do all this crazy error first. You can still have the error. But the other way to write that would be... Um, well, I'm going to do the new for if I wanted to do new performer using the other syntax, I could say function 
new performer, rec res. You're going to love this. We're going to do performer.find like that. Dot then we take that performer or those performers arrow function and we res.render and it would look the same as this. I know that uh, doesn't look. <laughs> I just yeah. didn't know how to take in all those arguments that we have to define it, that we have to define up there. You can I do the error that. too. So, <laughs> so you can use dot then, and then you can handle your error separately using a dot catch. So if there's an error, you put an error function, console.log error, and then you can redirect. So these are the two different ways to write this. Yeah, that probably looks a little nicer. Okay. This also doesn't have error handling built in because you'd have to have inside of this, if error, then do this. This just, this just makes me happy when I see this. And because it doesn't have this weird callback function in it. It just, hey, we're gonna take all the performers that we got from this query and then we're gonna do this with them. So most of the code we're gonna write for Game Goose is going to look like this. It's going to use dot then and dot catch. You'll see when we get all that reaction for sure. You you put res dot render. You're like, is that easy? And I was like, oh my god, like how does it? Oh. <laughs> how yeah. Is that no, this is the same same thing as here. These are these these are identical. They do the same thing. Only this has error handling built in. If we wanted to do error here and console log the other the error, we would have to say if error console.log error but that's how that's how these two are, are working this is just i th i think that's a lot more pleasing to the eye than this is but y'all can write them however you want i'm going to write them like this in game goose cuz they you're going to see that it's there will come a point where it is actually a lot nicer to have those cleaned up. Would you, start... sorry for interrupting, would you mind just leaving that uh, code commented out as well? And I can do that. Pushing it so we can have that uh, reference there. Um, sorry, I should have said that before you deleted it. Yeah. And I apologize for interrupting. Thanks. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, I'll, I'll type it back out and then I'll push my code. Let's take a break. Come back in 10 minutes. I'm going to type this out and then push. I took a, a screenshot. I could put it on Slack if you want. I'm, I'll, I'll just type it out. That way you have the actual code. That's, I mean, I, I know how to type it out. So we're good. All ready. Come on back, guys. So what we should do is go ahead and enter, if you'd like, some of these performers using the newly finished code that we've got. Uh, did you push this. any changes? I did. Okay. I'm going to do the same here. I already have Bill Murray. I don't have any of the other ones, but I'll add the rest of them here. Hey ben, I pulled your code and the for each function's not working for some reason. And like I'm exporting the movies in the index function, so I'm not sure why. This is happening. Let's check out your screen.
function index, movies, 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 movies. Um, can you restart your server? Yes, I... I'm going to refresh your page. Uh, hang on. You're not connecting to Mongoose because it should give you a connection strength. So can I see your database.js file and your config directory? Um, uh, you using Windows? No. No. Uh, Linux though, right? Yeah. Do I have to start it again in the terminal or? Let's make sure it's running. So let's make sure your Mongo DB is running. Okay. So, so do sudo service Mongo D start. Now try it. You have to restart your server again. There you go. Jeez. Okay. Thank you. Yep. We will get you some code to make sure that, make sure that happens automatically. I was able to stop sharing my screen. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my it's the happiest of days. Funny. <laughs> Funny what a couple of video drivers will do for your, you know, that also happiness and well-being. Um, but I did uh, update some stuff. I did like sudo update, blah, blah, blah. Um, I still mm -hmm. have more stuff to do on that end, but apparently one of those things helped. Cool. Well, right. good com computer works the way you want it to, right? Every now and then, at least. Cool. Okay, so we've got our movies entered, right? Is um, your code pushed? It has to be, sorry. Code to work out. My, my code is pushed, yes. And, Tyler, what did you say? Oh, I was saying now only if I could get my code to work like the computer. Oh, yeah. Um, so now what we need to do that we have our movies, we have our performers, we have many movies, we have many performers. Now we need to perform that association. Uh, we need to perform that many to many association. Um, unlike what we saw with reviews on one to many relationship, Multiple movies can reference the same performer, creating a many-to-many -many relationship. Here's a simplified example. So our movie docs, just pretend we're simplifying the Mongo IDs here, right? The document IDs, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, the cast for each of these is an array. And you're going to notice that the array is an array of performer IDs. So what, who, which performers, what number of performers are in movie two? Two, three, and four. Right. So performers two, three, and four appear in movie two. The only performer that appears in movie three is performer three. And performers one, two, and three are in movie one. This is a great example right here of how this is going to be set up and how this works. Because what we're gonna be doing is we're not gonna be storing this entire document inside of our movie docs. All we're gonna be storing is that document ID. And then Mongoose via populate, the populate method is going to go through and take care of putting all of this data. It's gonna populate all of that data when we do our query. So it'll fill in all that, that data just by knowing the, the document ID. It's like magic. I know I say it's like magic a lot. This is actually like magic. You're gonna love this. So uh, as part of your future projects, you're gonna need to plan a data model and document it with an entity relationship diagram. Um, here's an ERD that contains documents for that model. So we have our movie, right? Our review schema is embedded. So this will be our review. Our, all the information for our reviews will be embedded 
within our movie. Our performer is going to be referenced to our cast. So our cast, we're going to re-put cast back in there, but the cast is going to be now an, an array of object IDs. So it's going to be an array that has just a list of the object IDs for each of the performers. And then when we run populate, it's going to fill in all the rest of this data. Does anyone have any questions on that? This is really like, this is the coolest thing ever. Populate is so awesome. I hope you all use it. Um, all right, so we already have the performer model created. Now let's go back to our movie and let's update that, that movie model one more time. So now beneath our review schema, we're gonna add cast back in. But this time we're gonna put an array inside of that we're going to put type schema.types.objectid. You'll remember when we went over the list of um, different data types that we're allowed to store inside of a document with Mongoose, this is one of them. And this is how, this is how we achieve referencing. So what you have to do is we have to tell it to expect an object ID and tell it then that that object ID is referencing performer. Has to be spelled the same way that your model is when you're exporting your model. Is there anyone not clear on what this is doing? Uh, can you repeat that? Sure. So with reviews, we've embedded review schema. So this is our review schema, it lives in here. Cast, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, our cast members uh, for this movie, our performers for this movie are going to make up the cast. But instead of storing all of the information for every single cast member in this movie object, that would be inefficient, right? Because if any of that changes, we're going to have to go and change it in all of these different documents. We don't want to do that. We just want to change it once. Like if I have to go and fix Harrison Ford's birthday because I entered it wrong, I would rather enter it just once in the performer document, rather than having to go and update it in every single movie I've ever added into. That just didn't make any sense. So what, we, what we've done is we've said, you know what, instead of putting all of that data inside of here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the object ID that references that Harrison Ford document. So that every time I need to look it up, I'll get the most current, accurate, up-to-date information that is listed in the database for Harrison Ford. And the array, this is just saying we're going to store them in an array. So this object ID refers to a mongoose document or a mongo document ID dot underscore ID. That's what this is referring to. It's this property right up here in this chart. So think of it like this. Our movie, you know, this is Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? The cast is an array of object IDs. This ID it, it really it looks like something crazy, right? It's, gonna, it's not gonna, it's just going to be ABC. It's going to be like 5EF, like it's some crazy long character code like you've seen. Um, the, instead of referencing the entire document, we're just referencing that ID. You're going to see this in action here in just a second. So because we're using the reference performer, uh, it's, it's optional. Technically, we could just store object IDs in there. But because we put this reference performer here, it allows us to use populate, which you're going to see here in just a moment. So uh, differences between one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. In a one-to-many relationship, each of the many child documents belongs to only one parent document. Each time we, make a, we want to add a new relationship, the child document has to be created, right? So if we are creating a new review, we have to make a new child document. We have to make a new review document. In a many-to-many -many relationship, existing documents are referenced. And the same document can be repeated, uh, referenced repeatedly. New documents are created only if it's the first of its kind. Fits exactly to what we're doing, right? When we add Harrison Ford to this movie, we're not creating Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford already exists. If we need to create Carrie Fisher, 
because we're talking about Star Wars, we have to go create Carrie Fisher and then we associate Carrie Fisher with Star Wars. Right? We're not creating Carrie Fisher inside of our movie schema. We're creating Carrie Fisher inside of our performer schema. This is being used to create Carrie Fisher. This is being able to, uh, this is being used to create Star Wars. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a line of code that associates the two of them. It says, hey, we have Carrie Fisher, we have Star Wars. I wanna put Carrie Fisher in Star Wars. I wanna associate them because there's a many to many relationship there. With embedding, you can't do that. With embedding, you have to have the document created inside of the existing uh, model. So if you have a movie already and you wanna add a review to it, that movie, that review isn't floating off on its own somewhere in existence already that when you make it you have to put it within that document within the movie document that's what's happening here um so before a many-to-many -many relationship can be created two documents called an association those two documents must first exist that's the whole point of this um, this requires that the app first provide the functionality to create the two resources independent of one another have we done that can we create movies? Can we create performers independently of one another? Yes, we're good. Okay. So creating them then is the association of, uh, or creating the association is a matter of adding this object ID to an array on the other side of the relationship. That's it. We have it set up, right? Our cast is an array. We have this all set up, ready to push object IDs into. All we have to do is that. We have to take the object ID of our performer and just push it into this array. We'll be good. So the array property can be on either side, even both, but that's not usually recommended. You want to think about the app's functionality that makes more sense, right? For example, viewing a movie with its performers is slightly easier to code by putting the cast array on the movie model versus having the movies array on a performer model. It's just easier to code that way. And again, this is one of those things that when you're planning out your projects and you're uh, thinking about your data modeling, you're gonna have to talk to us about this. You're gonna have to say, this is how I wanna structure my data. I'm gonna use referencing. I'm gonna have this referenced here. This is where the you know, object ID is gonna be stored in an array. And I wanna use embedding here because you're gonna have to explain that. Um, and we're gonna walk you through it. You know, the reason that we are doing this is because we want you to learn the importance of how to structure your data and make sure that things are set up efficiently so that you don't run into issues down the road when you realize that you probably should use referencing instead of embedding. Um, okay, so let's keep on moving here. I'm going to skip those questions. We've added the cast property to the movie model. We're ready to implement the many to many relationship between movies and performers. But first, a quick refactor. After adding a movie, I want to see its details page. So instead of movie, uh, instead of like right now when we add a movie, it just goes back to the, the main page. So let's go over to our controller function for movies. Uh, that was right down here, movie.save. So instead of um, redirecting right here to movies, we are going to res.redirect to movies slash, we have to make this template literal. Movie dot underscore ID. So that just makes it so that when we add a movie, it takes us straight to the new movie page that we just added. Okay. So now for some fun. As a user, when viewing a movie's detail page, I want to see a list of current cast and add a new performer to the list. So let's think about what we need to do here. So this is what our page is going to look like. We're going to see the movie detail page, see all the details for the movie. We're going to see cast. And it should, should distrib or display the cast that's in that movie. If they're not in the movie, uh, if there's no one in the movie that shouldn't have anything there yet, but we should have a little box down here, a select box and a button next to it that says add to cast. So we can pick the performer 
click add to cast and then have that performer show up on that list. This is what you're gonna be doing in flights. So in movies show, we need to iterate over the movie's cast and use EJS to render each performer. Well, that's, that's tricky, we don't know how to do that yet. We don't know how to pull a reference value for something. All we have is those object IDs, right? We don't even have that yet. We haven't been able to add them yet. Uh, because we are using referencing, there are object IDs in there, not any of the actual performer data. This is where populate comes in. This is where we're going to use populate. So using a form of the dropdown, we can send a request to associate a performer and a movie. We're gonna need the list of performers to build the dropdown, but we only want to include the performers in the dropdown that are not already in the cast. So in this dropdown, if Carrie Fisher's already in Star Wars, I don't wanna see Carrie Fisher's name on this list. That's one of the bonus exercises for the lab, which I guess I shouldn't have made a bonus because we're teaching you how to do it right here. So what we need to do, I'm so, I'm so excited. You guys like pay attention for Populate. Populate is amazing. I think the, under, the importance of Populate was kind of understated when I took this course and I discovered afterwards how magical it actually is. So I'm gonna teach you how magical it is. So let's take a look at that show function, right? Our show function right now is finding the movie by rec.params.id. But what we want to do is we now want to populate. We want to populate all of the movies or all of the performers in that movie by getting all their info, all those object IDs, and turning those object IDs into actual documents. So what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this. I'm just going to leave this here for right now. I'm going to comment it out because I want you to see before and after. So function show rec res. The first thing we need to do is the same thing that we did before. We have to find the movie because in order to determine which movie we want the cast for, we're going to the movie page, right? We, we have to figure out what movie we're talking about, the movie in question. Movie.find by ID. Rec dot params dot id nothing's changed here but now what we're going to do is we're going to use populate so we found that movie we're going to chain on a populate method so we're going to say dot populate we want to populate the cast property so this is where the secondary method of or the alternative method of using dot then and dot catch makes the code a lot more sense and consistent. Um, the two different ways that you can write this, and I'm gonna put both of them in here, are using the, uh, you have to execute that callback function. That's part of the problem with this, right? Because we're not executing that callback function here within this find by ID, at some point we have to say, hey, it's time for a callback function because that, it's the part of every single mongoose function that we have. We perform our query and then return the result of the query to a callback function. We're not doing that in here because we're using dot populate. There's nowhere to put a callback function. So what we have to do is we have to execute a callback function. That's where the function goes. Function, error, movie. And that's where that lives. And inside of that is literally the same exact thing as this. It's the res.render. I'm just going to copy and paste it. Res.render movie show title movie movie. Same thing. This confuses people because you have to think about it as, oh, we have to run a callback function. If you're using the dot then method for doing this, it doesn't change anything. It makes it look exactly the same. So you could write it this way. Function, show, rec, res, movie dot find by ID, rec dot params dot ID, dot then or dot populate cast 
dot then you're going to take the movie arrow function and you're going to pass it to this render function this is where this starts to look a whole lot cleaner because you don't have to deal with this dot exec and the function and the it's just okay find the movie populate it then return it in a callback function to do this this looks a whole lot better to me than this thoughts which one do you guys like better no opinions but how how do you handle an error then on, on the second one catch Dot right? catch oh yeah error And then whatever, console log error. I'm gonna leave this in here just so you have access to it. I like that better. I think it looks so much nicer and cleaner, which is why that's how I'm gonna teach it to you from, from now on. You have to know what this is though. You have to know that the purpose of this .exec is executing a callback function because you're taking the callback function away when you use populate. Ordinarily that callback function would exist within the query. Like you have movie.find, what you're querying for, and then the callback function. But because we have to chain populate on here, anytime you chain something like this, you have to run .exec at the end of the chain. Running using dot then is essentially doing the same thing. It's saying, okay, when this is done, run a callback function. Same exact thing. And you can use it anywhere, whereas dot exec is only used after chaining. Do you have questions as to what populate is doing? Populate is taking all of Let's go to our model here. All of the cast members in our movie are listed as just object IDs. If you were to look at the data in the database, it would say Star Wars, 1977, yada, yada, rating, whatever. And when you get to cast, it would be an object ID and an array with another object ID and an object ID. There's no useful information there. What populate does is it goes through each of those different object IDs and says, okay, pull this document, put it, all of its details in there. For each one of those individual object IDs, it pulls all of the data for that and puts it inside of your document. So now you have access to all of the data for each of those documents instead of just the ID. It's crazy, crazy, so powerful. We good? Who's like horribly lost and confused right now? It's okay if you are. Okay. We're going to see how it works and then I'm going to explain it again. So let's go ahead and uh, query for performers that are not in the movie. And this is where st stuff starts to get a little crazy. So we need to access the performer model within this. We don't have the performer linked up here. And because we're gonna to need to know which performers are not already in something, we're gonna to have to bring in that model. So let's bring that in up at the top of our movies controller. Hey Take Ben, yeah. sorry, could, could you push your code real quick? I, I got a little, yes. a little behind. I will do that. Uh, code is pushed. So what we're coding out now is the ability to, when we show a movie, I want to list all of the performers that are 
not already in the movie cast. Because remember on our list here, when I see the details for a movie, I want to only see the list of, like, when I go to add a cast member, I only want to see the list of cast members that are not already in the movie. So what we have to do is we have to bring in that performer model so that we're able to, to perform a query on it, right? This, this is gonna look crazy. I get it, it's okay. You just gotta go through it a couple times. And I'm gonna, I'll repeat it a couple times and hopefully we, we end up happy at the end and all understanding exactly what's happening here. So let's go down to our show function and see what we're doing right now. Right now in our show function, we're finding the movie, we're populating the cast, and then we're returning the movie, which now has the cast on it, right? This movie is now gonna have all of those uh, cast documents on it. Let, let me demo this before we get any further. I think this is a good opportunity to do this. Let me console log the movie. And I'm gonna do this with and without populate. Look at that, we still have this handy. I think this is a good opportunity to show you exactly what Populate's doing. So don't follow along with me on this. Just hands off your keyboards and watch this. So right now when I run this, if I go to all movies and I pick a movie that I have details for, I don't have any cast in that one. I gotta find one where I have some cast. Fake movie. No cast. JavaScript. That JavaScript has reviews. Okay, so this movie JavaScript, when I console logged right here, the movie that I found, this is the, the movie object right here, this whole thing. The movie has now showing Boolean of true, this cast array right here is, is one object ID, right? I don't know what, what uh, performer that is. No idea who, who is in this movie. All I can see is the object ID. But if I do the same thing with the function that we've set up populate for, refresh, now, I can see that that's the cast is, look at that, that's a whole document. Populate went and got that whole document and put it inside of the array for us. That's what is happening with Populate. It takes that object ID that we had right here, just the single little object ID for our cast member, for Frank Smith, and populated the entire document. So we have the ID, the name, when he was born, when it was created, when it was updated, all of that information is here now because of Populate. Does that help a little explain what it's doing, hopefully? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So what we have to do now is we have to refactor the show action a little bit further such that we will, uh, get rid of that console log. Um, we want to pass the performers to the show page, right? We want to make it so that we have that ability to do the dropdown, but I only want the performers that are not currently in that movie. So what we can use, well, let's just start typing it out, right? Inside of our function, before we get to our render, I'll leave a little bit of space here. We need to find performers. Let's just start typing it out, right? We need to find a performer, find a bunch of performers. So performer.find, we know that's what that's gonna look like. If we wanted to find all the performers, that's what we would do. But we don't wanna find all the performers. We wanna be a little bit more specific. We wanna find the performers where the colon or the underscore ID is not in movie.cast. That's how this works. This is, a, this is saying, find me the ID where the, uh, or find me the performers 
where the ID of that performer is not in this movie's cast. That's what's happening here. It's crazy, huh? I know, it's okay. Same thing with this. Function, error. This is gonna be called performers. That's where our function goes. That's our callback. Same thing, mongoose query. We have the, the query, the search parameters, the thing that we're query, querying for, and then the callback function. The result of the query is passed to the callback function as the second argument because it's an error first signature. So the error gets passed, then the performers. That's, what we're, that's the result of this query, performer.find, where the ID is not currently in movie cast returning that as performers. So then what we can do is if we move this up, we're rendering our movie show page, still passing it the movie, but now we can pass it performers. This list of performers is a list of performers not in the movie. Isn't that cool? So cool. I feel like you guys don't have an appreciation for how cool this is yet, but you will. And when it clicks for you, you're gonna have that aha moment. You're just gonna be like, oh. You should be excited about this. This is so cool. All right, sorry. I'm getting wrapped up in excitement here. That's it. Now we just have to do a little bit, a little bit of refactoring. We have all the data we need now. So let's, let's go do that. Let's go to our show EJS. Movie show. And this is where we're going to, um, we're gonna have our cast list. So let's go ahead and uh, see the start cast list, end cast list. I want you to copy what's in here. We're gonna talk about what we're doing. Does that work? That looks, looks funny. That works, okay. So what's happening here is we added a div that says cast you can see that right here, right? So that div with cast is gonna have a list and we're mapping li elements here. So map, that's an array function, right? Or an array method. Let me go full screen here. So what we're doing is saying movie.cast, movie.cast is an array, right? And it's now an array of, right here, it's an array of objects. So if I wanna map over this, I want the name and uh, when they were born for every single performer. So I'm going to map across that object or across that, yeah, across, I'm gonna map the array. And for each of those objects, I want to display template literal here, the performer's name, and then in a small, this is just small, this is HTML. And a little bit smaller, I want to display when they were born. And we're going to switch it to locale date stream. That's it. That's all this is doing. It looks crazy. It looks like a bunch of gibberish, I know. But that's all this is doing. You're going to have to learn how to do map. So now we've got, we've got those showing up. Right, we have our artist showing up. All we need now is that little button down here. So, add to cast form goes below this comment. So let's go ahead and put that form in. Copy and paste that form, then we're gonna talk about what's happening inside of it. There's an action here we're gonna to need to fill in. We've left it blank for right now.
So we have a form. ID is going to be used for styling. Action, TBD. We're going to figure that out here in just a second. We have a select tag. And that select tag, again, is mapping. We're mapping over all of those performers. And then for each performer, we're putting the ID as the value. This is where the magic is happening here, right? You're not going to see this. The value of that is going to be in our HTML, which we're going to inspect here in just a minute so you can see. But the thing that gets displayed in each of those drop-down menus is the name of the performer. And this dot join is just making it so that they're all, you just have to do that when you're multiple option tags. You could also do a for each here if you wanted to. So let's check that out. Refresh our page. Notice how Frank Smith isn't on that list. That means our query is working. I also want you to see this. If we inspect the page, elements, we go down here to form, select. See this? The value is set at each of the IDs for each of those act or uh, performers. So the name property is going to be the value. Because our select tag name is performer ID. Isn't that neat? So whenever we select one of these, the value of that will be added to our action as rec.body.performerID. Because this is a form, that body parser takes our form data, whatever value is in the name, or whatever values in the field gets submitted as whatever is in a name property for the HTML element. Just like we have for all of our form stuff now. If I call this performer ID, when I hit send, it submits a post request to a route, which we're gonna determine here in just a second. And it's going to send a key value pair of performer ID that rec.body.performer ID will be equal to whatever performer ID I, or performer I send it. It may take you a couple iterations to get this. And that's what the repetitions are for. You have to practice this stuff to understand exactly what's going on here. That's totally fine. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if this was already covered and I missed it, but the EJS tags in the view, um, mm -hmm. previously after each line you were opening and closing, but in this one, there's a whole method or function just wrapped in the tags. Like it's not open and closed on each line. Yes. Why is that? We are using template literals that make that a little bit easier to do. And we are, um, because we're using template literals, it makes it work. Okay. Well, um, so the template, so the screen that you're on now, where it says option value key ID. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a template, template literal words. Mm -hmm. But below that, um, it isn't. So the dot join line is its mm -hmm. own separate line. Um, that that so squid with a middle finger is also allowing us to do this. Oh, OK. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, you're good. My uh, performers aren't saving for some reason. So the drop down box is just blank. And I've like tried adding performers a few times and it just stays that way. Let's check it out. Sure. Weird Al. 
Bonk. Post like, performers. 302. That should be throwing a 200 instead. So let's take a look at your route. Uh, route. Okay, let's take a look at your UI. I'm sorry? So <clears> your, <throat> your uh, show dot your new performer view. Post slash performers. Okay, controller function. You are not, oh, no, hang on. And I've pulled the code too, so I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah. You try restarting your server. I've done it a few times, but. Let It's undefined here. My model, maybe? Like not saving correctly or something? Let's take a look at your controller function again. And can you console log on line between 28 and 29, console log performer? And then try to add one. Undefined. Okay, let's take a look at your uh, ad view again. So you're new on performers. Name is good, born is good. Performers, post. Weird. Yeah. Can I see your, because it's hitting the function. Yeah, it's go just ahead and console, uh, go back to your controller functions for performers and uh, on line between 25 and 26, console log rec dot body. Object null prototype. Now that's what that should look like. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, are you? And you just copied that previous line, right? Which which line? I'm sorry. Rec dot body dot born and all that stuff. Lines okay. twenty seven and twenty eight. Uh, I, I fetched recently. I'm not sure if that was before we did this or after. I can try just fetching again. Let um, me let me add real quick. Can you console log the error you're getting back? If you're getting an error back in that function. Uh, uh, like down here? <clears throat> yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> hey, look at that. Uh-oh. So you already have 
a weird owl. Sure. But it's not showing. But it's not. But it's not showing. Weird. Or not okay. Long. So let's take a look at your populate. Maybe there's something wrong with that. So let's go over to your movies. Which which or movies? No, 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 no. It should it should be right there. Performer dot find all performers. Can you console log between nine and ten? Console log performers. And just refresh the page that you're on right now. Okay. That, right? Is that that? No. That's weird. Yeah. So you hooked up your um, Azure database thing, right? I have no idea. Go, on the <laughs> left, go, go to the A. Yeah. There right there. Yeah. And then go to attach databases. Click on that. Hit the refresh button up at the top. And then go to movies, performers, right click on that and go to delete. And then it should ask you to update. Well, unless you hit always update. Okay, now try to add a performer. Hey! There you go. There weird. we go. That was weird. Okay. Yeah, it's weird. Thank you. I was like, I don't know if I'm trying to follow along. I fetched it. It's not working. I can't open the details for my movies either. Uh, I just pulled the code and it's just still giving me an error. I'm also giving that same thing for details. Let's see what you got. So yeah, I'm on my movie thing. Uh, I click details for any movie and it just shows me that the title is undefined on line five. Okay. So it can't find the movie, I'm guessing. So let's start with uh, your function for this. So that's going to be your show function, right? For movies. So mm -hmm. let's go take a look at that. Oh. Um, the reason that this is happening. This is a fun error. I want somebody to theorize as to what our problem might be here. Is it a partial issue? Mm -mm. Oh. oh, movie title. Um, the details, no detail, or does that not matter? There's nothing wrong with the syntax here. Is it movies? Do we not Why don't you go take a look at your Azure connection and find that movie? So connection. go into your database connection on the left. Here? Find that, oh, yeah, sorry. hit refresh first. So refresh up at the top. And then find me that movie. Right, uh, any of those. Yeah. What, what can you see about this that might conflict with what we've just done? There's, There's already still a cast. Right. It's trying oh. to populate a cast from strings. Right? It can't do that. It's looking for object IDs there and it's getting strings. So it's not working. It's throwing an error. So you're not going to be able to click this movie. You should probably delete this movie. Oh, my movie's not that then. Any movies, yeah, any movies that you have added cast members to, you will now need to delete and re-enter. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? It can't find, it, it, it won't display it because you're erroring out. These are the real problems that you're going to have when you're building your applications. So if you try it with a new movie,
Okay. It should. Then... Yeah, it works now. Good error. Uh, good error? It, yeah, it's a good error. Because we get to see a real life, like, hey, this is something that might happen. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Finish, keep going, finish this lesson up here. Um, oh, yeah, and there's a little bit of CSS to tidy up the cast list, which I thought I already it's added. Already it's already Sorry. in there. Okay. Yeah. So the last thing that we need to do to be able to associate a performer to a movie is, if you remember in our list here, uh, where is it? On the show page, we have this action question mark. We have to associate a performer with a movie. And we're going to have to use a non restful name for the controller because we're creating an association between a performer and a movie. But create is already taken. So we're going to come up with our new name. But what we have to do here is if we look at our chart, we have to come up with one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships, right? We want to add a many-to-many -many association. So post, post ID blogs. This is the one that we're gonna be using here. This is the many-to-many -many relationship. We're associating, we're saying movies, movie ID, performer. So that's what's happening here. We're using this one right here. So if we translate that into what we need to do, we're going to go up to our routes. We're going to have to have this hit movies, movie ID, performers. Okay. Where's our performer ID coming from? Don't we need a performer ID somewhere in here? We have the movie ID of the movie that we want to add the performer to. Where's the performer ID coming from? In the populate? On our form. The map? Right. It's the value of our option tag. Remember, we stored our the ID of our performer there. So that's going to be attached to what when we submit this form? How does form data work? Rec.body? Yeah. Rec.body.performer ID is going to be sent to this route. So we'll have our movie ID here. We'll have our performer ID here. Those are the two pieces of data we need to associate those two things. So let's go write this route out. We're going to go into our performers router. We're going to do router.post slash movies slash colon ID, that's the movie ID, slash performers. We're going to call it performers controller dot add to cast. Because that name just makes sense for what we're doing. We got a problem though. Before we do that, we, we forgot to go write that route in, in our view, right? So let's go do that real quick. So let's go back to our show page. And let's, let's fix that route. So how do we do that? What the route would be what? Somebody walk me through it. Slash movies slash EJS movie dot underscore ID. Finish EJ, EJS slash performers. Exactly. There's our route. So let's go write the control. Just again, hits movies. It's a post request to movies, ID, performers, add to cast. Let's go over to our controller function, add it to the list.
Rack Raz. Do we have access to movies yet? And our performer controllers? No. We're going to need access to movie. Bring it in. Const movie equals require models movie. So now we have access to our movie model. We need the movie model and we need the performer model to be able to associate the two, right? So we have to import that, bring that in. So let's talk about what we want to do. We know that we want to push the object ID into the array of cast members for the ID or for the movie, right? So logic would dictate the first thing we need to do before we do anything else is find the movie. So let's do that. Find by ID. We're passing that in as rec.params.id. Error first callback. Movie. That returns our movie. Now we have our movie. Now that we have our movie, what do we want to do? We want to push our value into the cast. Movie dot push, or excuse me, dot cast dot push. And remember, we're passing the ID in via rec dot body because that's what we put on our option element as the, the value, or excuse me, our select element. The name property of that was performer ID. So that name property of performer ID got added to rec dot body as a key value pair. Rec dot body dot performer ID equals the object ID of the performer that we selected. That's how we set that up. So rec dot body dot performer ID. We've adjusted, we've added something to our movie model. So because we're not using one of the default mongoose methods to manipulate our model, we have to save it. Movie dot save function error. And we redirect, res.redirect to the same exact page that we're currently on. Template literal slash movies slash movie ID. And when we redirect to this page, that triggers another get request to movies slash colon ID, which then looks up the movie again refreshes the information and updates the fact that we have added a performer. And you'll see that now if we refresh the page, we can add Harrison Ford to JavaScript movie. Now he's on the list. It's like magic. Could you please go back to the views where you add that button? I think I missed that. Or the add to the cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, commit. Uh, views where I did add to cast. That's the show page. So we copied and pasted this form. I'll put this in Slack for you. So that form goes right beneath the add to cast form below this comment line. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. How are we feeling? That was fun. Talk to me, you guys are awfully quiet. I expected you to be a little bit quiet. This is, this is the toughest lecture of the week. Can you push that really quick? Already done. Oh. I feel like I'm gonna have to spend like an hour, hour and a half, maybe just looking at the code before I start on my my lab myself for myself. I would rewatch uh, the video instead of just looking at the code. I think that'd be a much better use of your time. Like you can you can look at the code all you want, but like listening uh, to the uh, explanations. I was talking about like explaining it out to myself, 
like oh. um, going back and annotating on the code and seeing what's happening in those steps as compared to the previous one and then adding to it. Cool. Yeah. Just when you were just starting to get single model CRUD, you got thrown <laughs> embeddings, uh, which is a lot of fun. But this, this is the, um, like the next layer of complexity, guys. I, this is like what you will start seeing happen in real world applications. And if you think this is kind of complicated, which it is, I'm not discounting that, but just imagine like the amount of relationships um, a Facebook application has, like a comment, and then you can like the comment, and then the like is associated with a particular user, but then it has to show up to another user, and the level of embedding that occurs on just a small little thing that you use. So you're just right now at that like, stage of development where you're about to see um, both sides of the edge and you're, you're, you're going to just start building more and more. So it's going to be awesome. Your project unit two project will actually require you to have a relationship uh, between some models, but you, you, again, this is one of those things where you got to break it down and take it step by step. Just like we did today, we found it by ID. Then we jumped inside and like then approached that particular other relationship. And so if you, if you go at this stage, like after today, if you simply copy paste an app over and change all the variables and submit that, it will just for sure not work because now you have custom relationships and stuff. So you want, when you build it, get build, the single model and then add the relationship and like take it step by step. And then it won't cause any problems in your life. Uh, but this is the very pivotal moment. Like if you go zero to 60 too fast right now when you're building, you're gonna have a plethora of errors and frustration. I, I can't agree with Jazad more on that. I think if anything, if you pulled anything from unit one when you worked on your project, the pseudocode, and having detailed pseudocode and being able to think about how you structure your data and how those relationships work. And think about what we just did today with the modeling. You know, When we wrote our controller functions out, it was, okay, before, I, I tried to do this with all the controller functions. Before we started actually typing code, I thought to myself, okay, what do we want to accomplish here? And if that helps you out, put comments in there and say, okay, the first thing we need to do if we're going to add a cast member to a movie is put a comment, find the movie, put beneath that, add a cast member to the movie, save the movie, redirect, put comments for each one of those different things, and then go write the code for it. You're going to, you're going to have to look that code up. You're not going to have that down by memory yet. That's, I wouldn't expect any of you to have that down like a hundred percent, like be able to write one of those functions at the end of this unit, you're going to have to look a lot of that stuff up and that's fine. That's the purpose of the flights lab and the purpose of the movies uh, exercise is to give you example code that you can look back at and say, Oh, that's how that works because you're going to need that when you write these applications, these controller functions that you're writing are going to be used the same, same way next unit. So you're going to have to know how this stuff works. This isn't just like a, let me skate by and kind of like, we're going to assume in unit three that you have this, you have this shit down. Like you need to know how these controller functions work and how mongoose works because next unit, we're going to take all this stuff. We're going to get rid of all the views. We're not going to deal with any of the EGS garbage anymore, but we're going to take all of the base knowledge that you have for, um, uh, for the backend server stuff, minus the views, and we're going to add on top of it. And we're going to literally throw React on top of that. So all of the controller functions, the routes, the MVC architecture, like you have to know how that stuff works at the end of this unit or else you're going to have a really rough time next unit. So spend time making those mental models of how everything fits together. Use your pseudocode when you're coming up with your project ideas and just write as detailed a code as you can. And when you're writing those functions out, just write the steps out before you write the function. That's the easiest way to do it. Is don't just try to, you know, jump head first uh, 
into writing one of those functions if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish. Write out what you're trying to accomplish and then code out the pieces of it individually, even if it's just one line per comment. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, the super extra important party mental exercise that you're gonna have um, is, and it's super challenging, is thinking about the MVC structure and whenever you build your projects or any project going forward in your life, you have to think about your data first. And we're gonna make you do that for this project, but you're gonna have to start thinking about, it. imagine this. So you have this movie and the cast and, and then this, you know, all this other stuff that's happening in this movies app or the flights as the tickets and destinations and all this. If you organize this data poorly from the very beginning, if you didn't actually have a good relationship with cast and movies, like you didn't think about that before, just imagine the nightmare that'll happen when you try to write these controllers later and be like, wait, how is cast like hanging out with movies and what is the relationship there? Um, you need to think about this um, a great deal before you start your project. And if whatever project that you have, um, unit one, you, you could kind of get away with not thinking about your data that much. You need to, you have to focus on like, okay, how do I break this down? This is my movies model. Okay, this is uh, my cast. And then, oh my God, do I have users who are gonna like some movies and who are going to share them? Okay, how do I put that together? So thinking about the schemas in data first. So in the MVC structure, always go M first. Um, in fact, at your dev team in your future job, uh, say you're coming up with a new product or a service at a, at a company, um, the data scientist will first have a conversation with the UX person. UX is like the experience design. They'll say, hey, look, we have this data. And the UX will be like, oh, we can enrich and populate this data and render it in a cool way. So that conversation actually happens first of like, what do we do with this data? That's when you, know, you the software engineers, come in and, and codify that and make it into a, a reality. Uh, so the the talks of data are happening far before you even get into the the uh, the arena, but as full stack engineers, right? Is that if a full stack engineer has to think about data, the design, the way the data is going to look like, um, organize all that, write the user stories, write the create the wireframes, and then also on the other side do deployment, and that's kind of what you're learning, right? As a software engineer, you're not doing the the prior and latter, you're doing the, the middle part, which actually is really cool because a UX designer could be really awesome, but just because it's a bad time in the market and a product cut release, they can get fired and laid off. While a software engineer, you started a project, turns out it was, you know, didn't make it through, you'll just get on another project. So you have job security because you're engineering. Engineering will always just pivot to the next thing. Um, so, but as a full site, you'll get the whole perspective. So. Nevertheless, no product will get out there unless they fully understand how the data, the shape of the data is going to look like before they even bring the engineering on board to think about it, to build the API itself. So this is the exercise that you want to do. And please write it down somewhere or tell yourselves, get a tattoo, data first. Always think data first. So then you will be successful in writing your controllers and doing everything else. Um, you don't want to be in your project week and you thought of, didn't think about your data in the right way, didn't create the right relationships. And then you're like, Wednesday, I got to start from scratch again. So we, we want to be able to put that up there. And this is the first time you're going to be thinking like this. So be good to yourself, but also it's a good mental exercise. Put some good deal of thinking before you even start writing code on what the data is going to look like. You will start visualizing the controllers, the views and everything once you get what your data is going to look like. Happy Friday. That being said, uh, is there any chance we could start looking at what our projects are going to be? I know it's early, but just to start formulating some ideas or do we need so, to learn something next week first? Uh, your projects are, and I was going to touch this here before uh, we break for the week, but I can go over this a little bit now. Your projects are going to be, uh, you're going to have a user model, which we're going to learn on Monday. Monday, we're going to teach you how to do authentication and authorization. So Monday will be building out the basics for Google OAuth. And we're going to teach you how to make it so that your user has to log in using a Google account 
to get into your application. Otherwise, they don't have access to it. That's going to be really fun. That is, it's a bad thing to have to do on a Monday because it's a long lecture and there's a lot of copying and pasting. But we're going to teach you how to do that on Monday. So your project has to have Google OAuth. You're going to have a user model. In addition to that, you have to have at least two other models. And those two other models, you can relate them in any way you want. Um, you have to have full CRUD. So you have to be able to create a resource, read data from a resource, update and delete data in some fashion across your application. You don't have to do it for both of your resources, but you have to have at least one instance of each CRU and D for your application. Um, you have to persist that data to the cloud in a MongoDB Atlas storage bucket uh, or collection, which we're gonna teach you this afternoon. That's, that's not that hard. It's the same thing as um, what we're doing now. You just have to change the connection string to a, a database in the cloud. Um, and it has to be styled well. So not, it doesn't have to be crazily styled, just styled appropriately. You can't have something that looks like flights like I showed you earlier, where it's literally just HTML and there's zero styling. That would be bad. Um, but start thinking about something you're passionate about and long and short of it is you want to build something where you're collecting data. You know, I'm collecting, I like shoes and I'm going to collect, uh, build an app to collect shoes and I'm going to associate shoes with pants. So I have a pant database or I have a pants collection and I have a shoes collection. And then I could have different pants associated with different shoes. That's a horrible example, but it, it, it works, right? You know, you, you would, those are two things that would be associated. Um, I had for my project, a like college basketball fantasy team app where uh, a user had favorite college basketball teams and favorite college basketball players. And I got around some of the requirements because if you use an API, you're allowed to not use the update feature. So you can have C, R, and D if you use an API in your app, but update's not very difficult. Um, but yeah, APIs are optional on this. Uh, they reduce your, uh, they reduce it so that you only have to use create, read, and delete data. You can, you can skip update if you use an API, but that's the long and short of it. We'll get the project requirements actually posted uh, at some point by the end of the day. So you guys can start thinking about it. Um, yeah, I think David just rolled his eyes at me. Um, it's fine. I'll go build it. It's okay. No, it's the same thing as last yeah. time. We don't need to rebuild it. Right. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just repost. Yeah. Is it not? Okay. Yeah, it, well, it, it's going to be fine because the only thing you guys haven't learned is the user model yet, which is like authentication, which everything will make sense. But if you want to go off into the weekend thinking about your project idea, just imagine you've got a user who's going to sign it. And, and, and maybe that user has the ability to see the stuff that they do and the other people don't. And then there's some kind of uh, relationship going on here, right? Where right? you can build a shoes and pants app or um, you can think about sort of like, oh, where's the, you can use Google Maps API if you'd like. You can go into a lot of different things. So think of an idea and then run it by us as soon as possible. And then we'll help you put it together in a manner that will make most sense and also, um, you know, that you'll be able to complete it in the scale of the time that you have. So come up with some cool ideas where you can save something in a database, you can show it, you can retrieve it out of the database if you need to, and that it has a connection with something else and everything, like don't even worry about the directions until next week, like the, all the, the, the nitty gritty of the project requirements. Mm -hmm. Next week, um, and here's another thing, because I know some of you are probably freaking out a little bit right now because of that lecture. And that's okay. And all the stuff that we've taught you. Um, auth is going to be tough, but we're going to teach you how to use a template. So when we get done with the auth lecture, you're going to have access to a template that you create. So you can just clone that and have auth ready to go. So that's one awesome thing. We're going to give you a couple sample apps to practice. Uh, I'll link those by the end of the day. Um, they're full instructions, things that I wrote. They have all the code. And there are examples that use exactly what we, what we just did. It's full CRUD with one data resource or two data resources. I can't remember if it's one or two. They may, may just be one. But you're going to have that as an example. We're going to give you another simple example 
for API stuff next week on just the back end stuff, no front end stuff. You're going to have another full CRUD example with front end and back end. You're going to have uh, Game Goose, which we're going to build as a class next week, where you learn how to do all of this plus socket IO plus auth plus uh, a bunch of extra stuff, API calls. Um, next week is going to be structured such that Monday we do auth, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in the morning, we're going to do Game Goose together. So in the morning, it's going to be me and you. We're going to do the same thing we've been doing. I have everything laid out, all the instructions. We're just going to go through day by day on Game Goose, and we're going to build that whole app together so that we're able to sign up users. We're going to be able to collect movies, search for movies. You're going to be able to add other users as favorites. You're going to see what their favorite movies or favorite games are. Um, we're going to build a chat room. We're going to build uh, – it's, it's a really fun app. That's going to take up our mornings. In the afternoons, we have um, other stuff. On Tuesday, I'm pretty sure David's going to talk to you about reg regular expressions. Uh, Wednesday, Shazad is talking about promises. And Thursday, I'm going to be going over how to build API stuff in Express and produce your own API so that you can... Yeah, I know some of you made API calls in unit one for your projects. Now you're going to be producing it. You're going to be building your own API because that's really all this is, what all this is about, right? Unit, four, unit three, when we get into React, the whole purpose of having a backend server is to return data and store data. That's what, the, that's what we're trying to teach you here. The EJS is just so that we can put shit out to the screen because we can't teach you React at the same time because that would be nightmarish. So we're going we're, we're gonna to scrap the EJS next unit and we're going to make all the back end stuff the same exact way that we've been doing it, but we're going to use React for the front end. So next week's going to be a fun week. And then Friday is, uh, I think we're going to start on your projects on Friday. We'll be working on project approvals. And if we need to wrap up Game Goose on Friday, we've got time earmarked. But next week's going to be pretty relaxed, just like this week. Uh, like hopefully end, end early, work on labs and stuff during the day. So. How are we feeling? Let me turn the recorder off. <laughs>